And we want to continue to talk about forgiveness. This is forgiveness part two. And we want to talk about you forgive you. When have you struggled with forgiving yourself? And when have you continued to carry guilt from long ago that you should have let go of long ago? Today, God wants to give you the two most important tools that you need to be able to forgive yourself, and they are grace and truth. God's grace and God's truth. We find them in John 1.17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through who? Came through who? Lord, please speak to us, teach us today how to forgive ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name and everybody says. Amen. Last week we discussed God forgives you. And we skim through Matthew 18, focusing on the ungrateful servants, which we'll get back to in just a couple minutes. And we saw a few other verses that explain God's forgiveness uh, towards us. And we discovered that God's forgiveness is not unconditional. While his love is conditional, his forgiveness requires two things, confession and petition, but we concluded that the power of confession brings three, two things to our lives. Confessing your sins will cause you to, number one, take responsibility. So many uh, great things happen in your life when you take responsibility for your actions. And the second thing is that confessing will help you not repeat the same offense, but it will cause you to repent from that sin and begin to begin begin to bring healing to your relationship with God and relationship to others. On the way out, if you didn't get a nail last week, on the way out, you can get a nail. They're dipped in red paint, which is a reminder that our sins have been forgiven. Put it somewhere up to remind you of what Jesus did for you. It's not to be worshipped. It is just a reminder of what Jesus did for you. Can somebody say amen? amen. So today, we want to look at you forgive you as a result of God forgives you. And sometimes it's easier to forgive other people than it is to forgive ourselves. And other times we won't be able to forgive other people until we have forgiving, forgiven self. And forgiving self isn't always easy, yet it is possible through God's grace and God's truth as you learn how to grace yourself. Somebody say, grace myself. In an online article in uh, 2021, Forbes magazine did a study of people at work, and they came up with this, that if you learn how to forgive yourself, you're going to be a better worker. Workers that are good at forgiving self are 65% more motivated to give 100% effort at work, and it stands to reason, because while you're at work, you're focused on the present. While you're at work, you're focused on the future. You're focused on your responsibilities of today and not your regrets of yesterday. Sadly, the surveys show that only 8% of people today excel in forgiving self. And it applies to our spiritual servanthood as well. Show me somebody who has forgiven themselves, and I'll show you somebody who is out there working for the Lord. Show me somebody that hasn't moved forward from their past, and I'll show you somebody that is still sitting there, not serving God, just dwelling on their past. Is anybody with me in God's house this morning? Percentage-wise, I want you to know that of all the sins that you've committed, God has forgiven, if you've asked him for forgiveness, 100% of your sins, okay? But what is that forgiveness number for you? What percentage of your sin have you forgiven you? So we return to Matthew 18, the story of the ungrateful servant. And when we last saw the ungrateful servant last week, he had just been forgiven a great debt, billions and billions of dollars that he owed his king. Yet he and his family were saved from being sold into slavery because the king had compassion on him. Yet on the way out from the palace, Jesus tells us that this happened. We continue the story in Matthew 18, verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him only a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. 
Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, just like he had done with the king, be patient with me, I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. Your wicked serv- you wicked servants, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Can somebody say amen? Amen. And how many of you can say, wow, how many of you, it sounds a little familiar. Am I the only one in God's house? You know, there's a a cutoff at the 210, and uh, it gets jammed there, and, you know, you forget. And so, you know, you're going, and all of a sudden, four lanes turn into one lane, and we've all done it out there on the 210 or another freeway. You're trying to get in, and you're just like, you're giving everybody that, you know, come on, please let me in. If Pastor Mona's with me, I'll tell her, roll down the window and stick out your arm, kind of wave it. And, you know, sure enough, somebody has mercy, and they let you in, and now you're in line, and somebody tries to cut in front of you, and what do you do? You speed up. Anybody with me? And so the ungrateful servant took his king's forgiveness for granted by not forgiving his debtor, and we do the same. Listen, when God has forgiven you, but you won't forgive yourself after what Jesus did on the cross. And we may think it's humble, it's noble, but it's actually an act of ingratitude when we're not willing to forgive self after Jesus already paid the price. Pastor, I'm willing to. I want to forgive myself. I just, I don't know how, and I feel incapable of doing it. Well, the Holy Spirit is here to give you the tools you need and to do for you what you cannot do for self. How many of you here have ever made a mistake? Okay, if you're not raising your hand, um, that's not only another preaching, that's another series. Can somebody say amen? But of the greatest mistakes that the ungrateful servant made was this, not to pass on the forgiveness, not to forward the grace. And to pass on to others what God has given you is not only a biblical concept, it's a biblical command. Okay, and so as we talk about passing it on, somebody say pass it on, of the many benefits we experience as God's family, as Jesus' followers, we are told to to pass these on to other people. The good things that God does for you, we are called to do for others. We are called to re-gift. Somebody say re-gift. How many Seinfeld fans do we have in God's house this morning? Re-gift. We've all re-gifted we received a gift and then we gave it to somebody else. We've all regifted that ugly sweater. <laughs> we all regifted that nasty Christmas fruitcake that somebody gave you. Okay, we've all regifted that gift that wasn't just you. And it's easy to pass on something you don't like, but God calls us to pass on the good things that He graces us with, beginning with self. And he, passed, he calls us to pass on, first of all, the blessings, Genesis 2, 12, 2. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse you. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Listen, if God has blessed you, and I know he has, he's done it so that you can be a blessing to other people. Somebody say, love. John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. You are loved so that you can love others. Everybody say gospel reconciliation. Gospel. 2 Corinthians 5, 18, and that's all we're going to read up there. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the, me- the ministry of reconciliation. Paul is saying this in verse 16 and 17. 
He says, we no longer, in verse 16, before he gets to that we have been given reconciliation, we've been made right with God so we can make others right with God. He says, first of all, in verse 16, that it starts out by this, that we no longer see others the same. Even though we saw Jesus in one way, now that we know he's the son of God and that he rose from the dead, we see him in a different way. And we need to do the same with each other. He says this in verse 16. He says, for now in Christ, the old has gone, the new has come, you have become a new creation. Now, how many of you are grateful that God doesn't see you for who you were or what you used to do? Yet, how many of us in God's house, even though we've been forgiven, continue to see other people for what they were and what they used to do? So if God, especially if they're a believer, we need to see them the way God sees us, as the new version. Is anybody with me in God's house? Well, pastor, you don't know what they did to me. No, but I know what you and I did to God. We crucified his son on the cross. I don't think any of us can compare to what's been done to us to what we did to God when we crucified his son. So, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. You have been made right with God so that you can reconcile others with God. How many of you straight up, no other way about it, you have been saved from hell by God's grace? Raise your hand. Keep it up. Now, who are you saving from hell? Are you with me this morning? Somebody say comfort. Comfort. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. We are comforted by God so that we can comfort others. Forgiveness, Matthew 6, 12. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And somebody says, and Matthew 18, 35, we see what happens when we don't forgive as we've been forgiven. We just read it. Brother, sister, you are forgiven so that you can forgive others. And the last one, grace. Somebody say grace. Grace. Somebody say grace foster. Foster. Amen. It's for all you Lucy fans out there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in what? What does it mean to receive God's grace in vain? It means to receive it and then not give it to somebody else. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. So now I tell you, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. In other words, once you come to Jesus, it always continues to be the day of salvation, even though you're saved, now it's somebody else's turn to be saved, because you're going to turn around and give them the same grace that God gave you. Is anybody with me in God's house? God has graced us so that we can grace others, beginning with self. Grace yourself. If you don't, you won't be able to grace others. How many of you like to set a high standard for yourself? You're kind of hard on yourself. Let me tell you something. It's impossible to do that and not be hard on others. If you judge self, you're going to judge others. If you're hard on yourself, you're going to be hard on others. But if you love yourself, you're going to love others. If you're patient with yourself, you're going to be patient with others. If you're merciful with self, you're going to be merciful with others. Jesus tells us to pass it on. Matthew 10, 18. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, so freely what? And there is a joy in doing for others what God has done for you. One of the greatest joys I have in my life. I love Pastor Mona. I love my daughters. But up there, honestly, one of the greatest joys I have in my life is one of the first times I went street witnessing and I led somebody to Jesus and led them in the sinner's prayer. 
There is a joy in doing for others what God has done for you. We see this in the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19, who gave away most of his money in response, in reaction to Jesus forgiving his sins. But we also see God's displeasure in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, when a servant didn't take what had been given to him and do with it what he was supposed to do. The Bible calls this servant wicked and lazy. Everybody say wicked and lazy. Turn around and tell your neighbor, I'm just playing. Can somebody say amen this morning? So we want to take what God gives us, and we want to give it away. Somebody say give it away, beginning with self. How can we do that? Well, two scriptures are going to help us shed light on that. And listen to this as we begin to establish the habit of forgiving self. You know, there are some things that you have to establish the habit because when the moment comes, if it's not a habit, you're not going to feel like doing it. See, you have to establish the habit, come what may, of worshiping God because I'll be the first one to raise my hands. I don't always feel like worshiping God, but I've established the habit in my life, come what may, I'm going to worship God. I don't always feel like talking to strangers about Jesus. Sometimes I'm hungry. I want to eat my meal. Sometimes I just want to get home. But I've gotten into the habit when Jesus tells me, talk to them about me. I drop what I'm doing and I talk to them because you never know if it's that person's last day. I don't always feel like it, but I've gotten into the habit of doing it. And listen, we don't always feel like forgiving self, but if you get into the habit, come what may, you will forgive self so that you can put your past aside and focus, stop focusing on you and start focusing on people that need Jesus. Is anybody with me this morning? So if you haven't learned, okay, how to grace yourself, I got news for you. Until we get to heaven, you're going to continue to make mistakes. I'm going to continue to make mistakes. And if we haven't learned how to forgive ourselves, it's going to be one long, rough, exhausting road trip to heaven. And how many of you want to enjoy your road trip to heaven? Church, give permission, give yourself permission to make mistakes. And what does the Bible say to us about us as Jesus followers making mistakes? What does it say to us about us as Jesus followers even after we've come to know the Lord's sin? Two verses that we read last week, Hebrews 10, 18, we're going to focus on three words. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice, somebody say sacrifice. So when our sins have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. And then the second portion, James 5, 15 and 16, and the prayer, somebody say prayer, Pray. offered in faith will make the, person, the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, this is the third thing we're going to focus on, confess. Somebody say confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So this morning, as we learn that we should forgive ourselves, these are three scriptural steps to forgiving yourself, and we'll see what we can derive, extrapolate from these verses, and the first one is this. You want to forgive yourself? Number one, stop sacrificing. Stop trying to pay for your sins against God and other people through personal sacrifices. Listen, can I preach to you? If you live with someone or you're in a relationship with someone that wants to make you continue to pay for your sins of the past, you have the right to tell them, in the name of Jesus, I apologize. I asked you for forgiveness. What you want payment for, only Jesus can pay that. And he already paid it on the cross. So please, let me go. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Nothing that you can do can ever atone for your sins. Only what Jesus did on the cross when he shed his blood. That's the only thing that can atone for your sins. Now, we can and should try to make amends. If we've offended someone, we should work hard to win their trust back. But continuing to try to pay for your sins is only to leave you feeling empty and powerless. Church, Learn how to trust in God's forgiveness. Stop sacrificing and start praying, but it's a specific, strategic prayer that James teaches us how to do when we want to heal and move on 
and learn how to forgive ourselves, what do we pray? Three things. Number one, when you pray so that you can move on and you can learn how to forgive yourself, number one, acknowledge. Somebody say acknowledge. Acknowledge, acknowledge that you sinned against God and another person. Acknowledge that damage was done. It's not right of us to apologize to someone and say, hey, I'm sorry, but it wasn't that bad. Who has the right to determine how bad it was? The one who did the harm or the one who was harmed? Anybody with me? And so let's acknowledge in our prayer, Lord, I did some damage, but Lord, I acknowledge that only your blood can pay for what I did. Number two, admit that it was your fault, okay? We talked about this. We saw this last week. Forgiveness from God and others only comes through claiming responsibility for the offense. So I'm going to tell you to do something in just a minute. And the third one is this. Acknowledge, admit, and then accept. Accept there's nothing you can do to take back what you did. If anybody here has a time machine, I want to see you after the service. Because there's a lot of things I wish I could go back and redo. I wish I could be a better husband. I wish I could have been a better father. I wish I could have been a better uh, pastor all from the beginning. But there is no such thing as a time machine. So we need to admit it was my fault, but then this is what we need to do. We need to stop replaying it. We replay it. Rewind. Rewind. And we watch it. Oh, my God, I can't believe I did that. And we replay it again. Oh, my God, I can't believe I said that. And we replay it again. Oh, my God, I hurt the people that I love the most in the world. Brother, sister, stop looking back and start looking forward to the only one who can heal your past and those who you have offended, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Except there's nothing you can do except surrender things and people to God. Number one, stop sacrificing, start strategically praying, and number three, start confessing. James tells us to confess our sins to God so that we can be forgiven, but he says confess your faults to each other so that you can be healed to other Jesus followers. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. How many of you don't like talking about your past with other people? I don't. Yet today, Pastor Israel, I can because I've gone through the hard work of forgiving myself, of making amends with other people, and today God can use my past to set people free. Can I preach to you? If you're willing to do the hard work of be forgiven and be healed, there's somebody out there that needs to hear your story because they're going through the same thing, but they're going through it without a Savior, without someone that can forgive them, without peace, without a God who knows how to heal, without a God that knows how to change somebody's past. But here we are in God's house having a pity party because I don't want to talk to anybody about what I've been through. It's not all about you and me. It's about moving forward from the past so that people that don't know Jesus can be saved set free and forgiven the way the master has forgiven us and set us free. What did Pastor Mona serve that boy for breakfast this morning? Four things happen when you and I confess. And here's the first one. Obedience and healing. Pastor, it's hard for me to talk to people, to open up to people. Yeah, you know what? It is hard, but it's not impossible. Because if it was impossible... God wouldn't ask us to do it. But anything God asks us and tells us to do, it's only because it's possible and it's for your good. Is anybody with me in God's house this morning? Okay? And the first one is this. When we confess, when we do what we're supposed to do and confess our faults to another, four things happen. Number one, obedience and healing. In the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, one of the ways God honors his people's obedience is through healing. Abraham and Sarah... They didn't want to do it. They didn't believe God. She laughed, but God was tolerant with her. And the Bible says they were obedient, and God healed them. Naaman, 
Didn't want to dip himself seven times, but God was patient with him. He did it, and God healed him. Old Testament and New Testament, widows galore obeyed God, and he brought their children back to life. How many of you need a child be brought back to life? Obey God, and he will honor your obedience through healing, salvation, spiritual healing of your children and grandchildren. The second one, when we start confessing, something else crazy happens, and I'm a witness of this. Peace of mind. Everybody say peace of mind. When you meet with a life group leader, when you meet with a a, a pastor, when you meet with somebody that's discipling you, and you share with them where you've been, some of the things you were involved with, I want to tell you something. The devil can no longer play the same mind games that he did with Pastor David. And maybe you go through it, I don't know, but I'm going to make myself vulnerable and share with you what I used to go through. I'd be getting ready for church. And I'd be excited about coming to my father's house. But there was a voice that I could hear. Hypocrite. And there was a voice that would remind me of all the junk from my past. How many of you got junk in your trunk like pastor? But I met with my pastors. I met with my leaders. Pastor Henry. Man, he has enough to bury me. But I got stuff on YouTube, Pastor Henry, so we'd bury each other. But after I opened up, the next time I came to God's house, and there I'm trying to worship God, and I hear the devil saying, if they only knew. Well, after I talked to Pastor Henry, after I talked to godly men, I was able to turn around in the middle of worship and tell the devil, and I look crazy doing it. We look crazy when we have another conversation in the middle of worship. But there I am worshiping. And I'm worshiping God, and I hear, if they only knew, I was able to turn around and say, you know what, fool? They do know. They have forgiven me. They have accepted me into this church. They have made me family. They call me friends. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, and I get back to worshiping God. Start confessing, you'll experience healing. Start confessing, you'll experience peace of mind. Start confessing, and the power of your past sins of darkness is broken because God grows things in light. The devil grows things in darkness. So the sooner you expose your sins to a loving, caring, fellow Jesus follower, the power that they have over you will be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. And number four, somebody say learning lessons. How many of you here, like your pastor, have made the same mistake a few times over and over again? All right, we got some honest people. Some honest people in God's house. Listen, you have a better chance not repeating the sin. How many of you, oh, I don't know why the Lord is bringing this one to mind. How many of you even recently had an outburst with people you love and you promised them, I'll never do it again, yet you turn it on and the news is coming out in front of you, instead of your favorite soap opera and you just, you know, you, you blow it. Somebody cuts you off in traffic and can I, can I preach to you? I don't know why, baby, the Lord is telling me to say all these things, but it's going to heal somebody. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I kind of have kind of a strong personality. And so, you know, I went from, from yelling, you know, at people at home to when I would get mad, just yelling. And my family would just get quiet and back off. And I tell myself, I'm not yelling at them, but I'm lactose intolerant. And they put cheese in my hamburger. And my daughter, can I preach to you? I remember years ago, my daughter recently told me, Dad, remember that time? They messed up your order at McDonald's, and you got your cheeseburger, and you threw it on the table. I said, yeah, baby. Why? She says, that scared me. And in my mind, I'm not throwing it at her, but I'm causing all this tension in my house. Brother, sister, you and I affect people around us. You and I affect people around us, and if we want to stop doing the same thing over and over again and hurting people, you got to get with Pastor Henry like I did. You got to get with Pastor Israel. You got to get with your life group leader and just say, you know what? I can be a hothead. Please pray for me. That's it. I didn't get into 
details with Pastor Henry. I just shared a few things with him. I asked him for forgiveness, and I started seeing changes in my life. And you will experience the same thing. You have a greater chance of not repeating the same offense over and over again and learning your lesson when you process it and you confess it with the safe, trusting, loving Jesus followers. Anybody with me this morning as we begin to close? Somebody say hurtful versus harmful. St. Paul sent a letter to the Corinthians that hurt them, but didn't harm them. It hurt them, but in the end, it was good for them. Confessing, opening up to other people might not be your thing, might make you uncomfortable. It might even be painful and hurtful for some, but in the end, it's good for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7, verse 8, 9, and 10 Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. You good people still with me this morning? When we as Jesus followers sin, it is harmful. It negatively impacts our relationship with God. It negatively impacts our relationship with those around us. It's like excessive candy. How many of you here love you some candy? It tastes good at the time, But later, it leaves a cavity. It leaves a hole that's doing damage and just keeps eating away and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That's sin. And cavities are painful and harmful. But then we go to the dentist. How many of you have a love-hate relationship with your dentist like Pastor David does? And the work that the dentist does is painful And it's hurtful, yet it is good for you. And candies and cavities start good, but end up being bad for you, like sin. However, confession, forgiveness, getting together with someone and and, and just talking to them and beginning a process of healing, they start out painful, they start out hurtful, they start out uncomfortable. I mean, who wants to bring up the bad things we've done. Yet in the long run, confession, forgiveness, healing, although hurtful, although painful, confession is good for you. Godly hurtful sorrow leads us to repentance. If you have repented of your sin, God forgives you so you can forgive you. However, to continue to dwell on it, to live in regret, is harmful for you because it keeps you in a prison and the master died on the cross to set us all free from all prisons. The ungrateful service ended up in a prison with regret for the rest of his life because he didn't pass on the forgiveness, because he didn't forward the grace that was given to him beginning with self Church, don't just regret. Repent. Forgive you. And then pass it on. Let Christ's grace and truth set you free. Grace yourself. And grace and truth. Somebody say grace and truth. Don't believe the lies of the devil when it comes to your past sins that God has forgiven. Lie. God wants you to suffer for what you did. Lie. You have to pay for what you did for the rest of your life. Lie. You're the most selfish person in the world. Lie. You knew better, so you have no excuse. Truth. In Christ, you are forgiven. Truth. God is not finished with you yet. Truth. God's grace 
is more than enough for you, always available for you, regardless of your sin. So church, if God can forgive you, you too can forgive you. 